much you owe. Yeah. And <laughs> written note. Sure. Or physically. Oh, hi. Energy, energy, energy. <laughs> that creates the lid. Everybody so if you and I disagree on something, then you must be erased and banished from life. So how does I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit here and drink this water. Hi guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's Sam Speaks and Sam Speaks Radio on iTunes. Today we have Mark Spain of Mark Spain Real Estate. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. So tell us, first question, I know this gets asked so much. You started uh, in a franchise, working in a franchise, with a franchise, and then you broke off into your own. What was the franchise or number of franchises, and why did you decide to break off? Yeah, so I was with Remax for 15 years. Um, wrote that out to about 2011. 2011, I joined Keller Williams. Uh, I did that from 2011 through the end of 2015. Mm -hmm and joined uh, or broke off and went independent, went indie, I guess is the trendy term these days. <laughs> um, and created my own brokerage, Mark Spain Real Estate, in January 2016, so about eight months in. And the reason being, really I'm, just, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to own my own assets. Mm -hmm. I wanted to build my own assets. Um, uh, I love Keller Williams. I think they're a great company. They, uh, my mentorship under Gary Keller and the things that he did for me and taught me were, you know, I'm grateful forever for. Sure. Um, but it was just it was just that next season of my life, the next season, the next chapter in my uh, in, in my career, and it was just time. And right. it's, it's gone what, great. At what point did you or does someone know when it's time to break off and potentially start their own? Um. So for me, I mean, I. It's probably something I always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, when I left Remax in 2011, I had three choices. I, I could open up a Remax franchise, I could go independent, or I could join Keller Williams, which at that time I didn't really know much about Keller Williams. Um, and it was an office near my house, and I decided to do it. The economy was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some values in Atlanta were down 50, 60%. Wow. I just wasn't ready. Um, and I think I wanted to learn a few more business things, you know, to just gather my skill sets together, just so I could take it to that next level. So that I'm, when I do things, I like to be well prepared. Sure. I mean, it's, it's not perfection, but it, it's I like to I like to have the information and the knowledge to be able to do it. Um, I think sometimes you just have that inner voice that tells you what you want to, what you need to do. Um, and, and it, it just was time. That's that's. Period. Sure. Let's talk about team. So when you were with KW, you had a team of, I want to say it was over 60, correct? Or was it at 60? Yeah, it's probably, so we're right at 100 right now. So it's probably with 60, 65, and we've been on a hiring frenzy um, ever since. Right. So how did you start out with even deciding you wanted to be a part of a team? I mean, how many transactions were you doing that you said, you know what, I really need to build a team? Yeah, so for me, as I, I took over a book of business from my dad, um, and, I, and I think that what the, the number, the magic number is probably around 50, 60 transactions okay. to hire your first assistant. I mean, back in the day, that's probably not the way we did it. Um, we're, we're, back in the 90s, we, we were a team long before what I considered a team being the cool, trendy thing to do. Right. Um, we hired buyers agents and we didn't have listing agents and we just were just kind of in, in a frenzy trying to figure this out. And over time I just studied models and, and, and learned to uh, get better at it um, and, and now we have a really well-oiled machine. Sure. What do you look for? Let's say I wanted to join your team and I didn't really have any experience versus if I did have experience. What questions are you going to ask me? How do I yeah. join? We, we, hire, we, we hire both types of people. Mm -hmm. um, we hire a lot of people right out of college. I mean, honestly, I, I like when somebody's inexperienced because they learn it, they learn the business the right way, um, like I say sometimes the Mark Spain way, mm -hmm. um, and taking care of customers and communicating and, and doing the things right from day one versus getting, you know, having bad habits and try, me trying to help you break them. Mm -hmm. um, we, but we also hire experienced people. Um, the average age of our workforce is pretty young. It's about 32 years old. Mm -hmm. So we hire a lot of millennials, which I love. Um, and why particular do you love millennials? I think it's sometimes they can be the most challenging age group, mm -hmm. but for, you know, the most rewarding for me, honestly. Sure. I'm a teacher at heart. Um, I love I love teaching and coaching people, and 
I like taking somebody that's you know 23, 24 years old and, and pouring into them and challenging them and making them feel uncomfortable and watching them over a year or two, three years just transform their lives and even if they leave our company and they come back to me and hug me and tell me you know how, how it changed their lives. Sure. How I, you know, how working at our company improved their relationships at home and, and just lots of different things. Um, that's that's success to me. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's um, it's not about things. It's about helping people. Sure. But you ask the question, what do I look for in somebody? Um, I look for somebody who. What I'm looking for is a Michael Jordan or a LeBron James before they become that person. Mm-hmm. So I'm always recruiting. Uh, I ask people lots of things about their lives, lots of things about their college years, lots. Just when I'm just if I meet somebody in, in in the lobby of this hotel and I'm talking to them and they're with another company, I'm I'm talking to them, gathering information. I'm trying to see what your what your what your track record was like. Mm-hmm. Were you the captain of your soccer team? Were you uh, were you a leader in your fraternity? What what, what did you do? to get to where you're at. And sure. having a 4.0 really is not what I'm looking for. Sure. What I'm looking for is somebody who has something in their past, some kind of chip on their shoulder, whether it's, my chip is I'm very competitive. Mm-hmm. I like to I like to win. And I'll outwork you. You may be smarter than me, but I'll outwork you. If you get up at five, I'll get up at four. If you get off at six, I'll get off at seven. And I'm looking for people who have that kind of work ethic, who have something inside them Maybe they were, uh, maybe unfortunately they they got pregnant as a junior in in college and had to drop out and never finished. And they're so pissed off internally that they never, you know, all the people around them have college degrees and they don't. Sure. And that driving force, you can't buy that kind of energy. Right. You cannot, you just, you can't harness it. Right. Um, What should agents expect though? Because I completely agree with all of that, but I feel that sometimes people get in this business, they're so driven, they're so energetic, and then you kind of see, because they're not able to bring in their business, do deals, and you kind of see that that energy and that drive fades off. So how do you how do you identify who's the person that's gonna be in it for the long run, and then how do you continue to motivate that person and keep them from burning out? So my mentor taught me one time, and it's gonna sound probably a little harsh, um, A, you can't fix people, you fire them. I mean, and, and that's true, meaning that if you're not a motivated person, mm-hmm. I can't make you motivate. Well, I mean, I guess I could get, you know. Could try. My coach says sometimes, yeah, you can motivate people, Mark. Get your gun out. You put a gun to their head. You can motivate them. I said, because that's not that's really, that's not really scalable. <laughs> um, but, you, but you don't motivate people. What you do, and this is, you hire motivated people. Mm-hmm. And you can coach somebody up 10, 20 percent. Sure. That's about all you're gonna do for and and, and if if I can jack you up and really just just put pressure on you, you're always gonna go back to who your natural self is. Um, I can help you discover things. I can I can encourage you to become a really good reader and a, and, a, and a lifelong learner and be really careful who you hang around with mm-hmm. because those two things who you hang around with the books you read are gonna be the key determinants in your life as far as your trajectory and your success and. You know, if you want to learn how Sam, Wal- you know, the people like Sam Walton or um, any, any, you know, Steve Jobs, the way they think, you go read their biographies. Right. You learn how those super successful people think, how they act. And, you know, one key ingredient, I think, that's important for somebody who's in either top level leadership or uh, even in sales, you, you want a high level of economic drive, meaning you want somebody who wants to make a lot of money. Sure. And you know, it's, it's people plateau out and you, you can't understand it. It's just because their economic drive. If I made a million dollars this week, I want to make a, you know, I want to make, of course. it's not, it's not money. It's a scorecard right. for me. And that's, that's how driven I am. And so I'm, I try to find people who are like that because I can't make you want to make more money. Right. I can give you an awesome platform coach and lead and guide you, but it's up to you at the end of the day. Right. Let's go back to the actual team structure. So one of my personal questions has always been, because I've dealt with this um, with my company, you know, you have your team and it is the Mark Spain team. What if I'm the seller or the buyer? I want to work with Mark. You don't actually, you don't transact, correct? No, I don't. So what do you say to that? How do you solve that problem? I think that over time, it gets less and less of an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think a lot of it's just come uh, overcome with the person who answers your phones. Sure. It's, it's, it's a script. It's an explanation of how the process works. Um, you know, Sally, who works for me, specializes in homes and polo golf and country club. She's going to be coming out and meeting with you. Mm -hmm. Jimmy specializes in homes in Windermere. He's going to come out and meet with you. You just have to, and if somebody is just so intense on working with me, then at the end of the day, they probably aren't my client. Just like you're sure. not going to, you know, um, the president of General Motors is not going to help you demonstrate your car. Right. He's not going to be your sales more, salesperson. Um, it's no different. I mean, we're, we're a business. Mark Spain is the brand, mm -hmm. and we have people that work for us. And I think, that, again, I think that at our level, that, that, that actually is not really a big issue. Sure. So you're a coach yourself, and coaching and training is very, very important, as it should be. And you were saying you have your experts in different areas. What are you doing to continue to train them to continue to be the best in that area and expert? Are you doing, you know, pop quizzes or just questioning them on, you know, do you know this inventory or that inventory? What are you doing to make them stay on their toes? I, I'm laughing because uh, I was watching some emails this past week from one of my uh, leaders communicating with the ISA department and they've created these quizzes. Mm -hmm. ISA meaning inside sales who they take all our, all our leads come through our inbound and inbound sales department and then they're just, you know, we book the appointments for the agents. Mm -hmm. And we have quizzes now for them weekly, meaning just learning, A, learning who our agents are, A, learning our inventory, all different types of quizzes that they have to take. And they sure. have to, because we want them to know our inventory. And we also want them to know our agents. Um, how I lead is, first of all, I lead by example, but second is, and I have high standards for myself, so mm -hmm. that creates the lid and, and everybody has to rise to that level. So if I'm a slack person, the people around you are gonna be slack. Sure. Um, Secondly, I, I hire people, so if I'm an A player, I'm gonna hire A or higher. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna hire B minus, and I think that a lot of leaders do that, and then they have a harder time holding those people accountable. So I hold my leadership team you know, highly accountable. If you work for us, you're weekly going to meet with your manager and do what we call a 411 or a 101, and we're gonna hold you accountable. We're gonna go through what you did last week, and then we're going to look at what you're going to do this week. And, and if you report to me, I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you. Um, and, and it's a good pressure. It's a healthy pressure. It's, it's a pressure that, especially when I know that you can do more than you're doing. Sure. Um, and I just spend a lot of time with people in my organization, the, the, the leadership, challenging them to think bigger. I think that we all, a lot of us make a mistake that we just get comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would rather you tell me that I mean, I, I, we'll, we'll use a, uh, I'm trying to give you an example. If you said that you were going to do 50 deals, um, this, is, this is an example. So I do a lot of management while walking around. I'm, I'm, I go into one of the sales rooms in the back of the, the building, and I'm, I'm sitting there talking to a group of sales list, listing agents, and I ask one of the girls, so what do you want to do this year? She says, you know, if I could do 50 deals and make $75,000, man, my life would be really in good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what if you double that? What if you just said seven? What if you doubled your income? Say I want to make 150, and do 75 transactions. Heck, if you get 60 and hit 120, are you going to be happy? I'd rather you, if you meet, if you reach all your goals all the time, you're you're not setting them high enough. Sure. You should really, honestly, almost never reach your goals, because otherwise you're not stretching yourself far enough. All right. And it's interesting this particular individual that I had this conversation with back in January. She's on track to close 75 units. Wow. Um, She's been in the business of probably less than a year. Oh, wow. And she'll make somewhere in the 120, 150 range at like 24 years old. And what is she doing? She's what are list, you? She's a listing agent. Okay. So how is she getting those listings? How are you so we book, we, we, yeah, we, we book, we, we train people. You know, we, we, we have a big training program. And when somebody comes in, we have a director of training. And we take those new people, you know, and they spend about six to seven weeks with uh, James on our team who's a director of training. Mm -hmm. um, he used to be a listing agent for us. Um, tra training is a big deal. We hire, a, you know, we have a, a coaching company that comes in and does coaching for us on mm -hmm. a regular basis, you know, teaching us anything from NLP to scripts, dialogues. And we do those in bursts. They're four to six week sessions. Mm -hmm. And then we give them a little, then we give them a break. We go really heavy for four to six weeks, and then we give them a break. Um, and the difference between this particular individual and some other agents is she knows how to control her time. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my next question. Do you actually have a schedule 
that you know everyone always wants to know well from what time to what time should I be focusing on this or you know whether it's prospecting for social media PR whatever it is do you have anything that you live by and how does that work uh, I mean my life's pretty scheduled out I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, pretty rigid guy mm -hmm. I mean I like to some of my leaders that work for me are a little bit more rigid than me but I, I like to kind of create some flexibility time in there but Usually my mornings are spent, you know, I get up at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's very important to, to, to get up early, um, to start your day off exercising. I go to the gym well, at least five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, I do cardio and I do, you know, some, some uh, you know, weights and stuff. Just to really get my mind right. I do also run. Um, I think that's highly important to get your day started off. And it also helps you the rest of the day kind of create your energy level, but it also keeps you calm. Right. Uh, secondly, I get in the office, you know, I come, then I come back home, I spend a little time with my kids. This is me personally, I spend a little bit of time with my kids before I, before I go into the office. And I get in the office about 8.45, 9 o'clock. Okay. Um, I don't work 90 hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you have to if you manage your time. And then I spend most of my mornings with, you know, meeting with my leadership team. Um, and then one, one other thing, kind of going back to accountability and how we do things, is we also spend one day a month off-site. Um, at, a, at another facility outside of our office and I spend that with my leadership team mm -hmm. and that's a big deal you know we're going over their yearly plan are they on target are they off target and just spending a lot of time creatively thinking about what the direction of our company sure how much time should somebody spend prospecting a minimum three to four hours a day any specific time or any specific yeah so when I'm, when I'm coaching the agents and I'm talking to the agents you know my suggestion to them is get up Get up, get, learn to get, they're millennials. Mm -hmm. Learn get to up. get up at 5 o'clock, 5.30. <laughs> I don't mean that in any discrediting way. No. What I'm saying is learn to go to bed earlier and get up early. If you get up early, you'll go to, you'll force yourself to go to bed. Um, so get up at 5, go to work out, do 30, 45 minutes worth of exercise. For them, get in the office about 7, 7.30. Get all your junk cleaned up mm -hmm. before the world wakes up and, and your life begins to blow up. Because, you know, this business is a time suck and it'll suck. You'll, if, if you allow it to, it'll suck the life out of you. Sure. And then at 8.30, we have a, a morning huddle, a daily huddle. And then at 9 o'clock, they need to be on the phones from 9 to 11 prospecting. Mm -hmm. If they did half that, I'd be happy. Okay. So uh, my mentor used to teach us four hours. So if you did that from 9 to 11, did any cleanup between 11 and 12, go eat lunch, and then all your appointments are in the afternoon. Sure. Or any follow-up or things that you need to do. If you will do that, you'll make a fortune. Sure. I mean, let's face it, what we do is not rocket science. No. I mean, we're not building rockets. We're not building cancer drugs. I mean, we're just, it's whoever is the most, uh, has the most discipline in their time and who, who masters time management wins this game. And persistence. And you gotta care about, I mean, these are the basics. You gotta care about people. You gotta have a servant's heart. You gotta, you, you gotta wanna do good, good, good in the world, you know, and communicate. Sure. I mean, if you text me, I'll text you back. But if you call me, I'm not texting you back. Right. I mean, these are just the And best. I think that's huge. I think that's, <laughs> no, I think that's huge. And that's something that I've spoken about um, in past interviews with people, how nobody wants to talk on the phone anymore. It's text or it's email. And communication can definitely get difficult. And a lot of millennials, they just want to text. It's so frustrating. I tell people, communicate with people the way they want to be communicated. Sure. If they wanted to text you, they would have texted you. But if they text you and if a conflict begins, mm -hmm. at, any time, at any point in a conversation, this is my rule, at any point in a conversation, conflict arises, pick up the phone. Yep. Period. Yep. You'll solve it because that's where things get squirrely. Yeah. I actually had a client and I had to let them go because um, we would email. They would not let me call them or meet them in person. And there was a miscommunication there, yeah. and it was very, very frustrating. So instead of you know spinning my wheels and getting frustrated, I let them go because they wouldn't allow me to communicate with them appropriately. So I think that's also important for people to know. Not everyone is going to be your client. Not you shouldn't be working with everyone. Well, you shouldn't. Yeah, you can't. You're, this is not. You, you can't let your clients hold you hostage. Sure. And. Sometimes you gotta let them go. Sure. Sometimes just saying I'm gonna let you go will wake them up. Sure. And you're probably just doing a good justice to them. I mean, we've we've let some people go over the years, and they're like, "What?" And that's just, just not a good fit. Yeah. One last piece of advice for someone trying to break into this real estate market and 
be successful in their own mind? Um, be a lifelong learner. I mean, that's that's one of the probably the critical things in life is you're never going to know it all. Mm -hmm. Perfection's overrated. You're, you're never going to be perfect. Just sometimes you just got to go do it. You know, be informed, but just just go do it. Um, be very careful who you hang around with. Um, you, you need to pick your friends carefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, there, it, it's a negative world at times we live in, and try to insulate yourself and keep those people away from you because it, it's a very hard business in the sense that you're dealing with a lot of emotions, you're dealing with a lot of people, um, things can get squirrely, so you, you want as much positive energy around you as possible. And so get rid of the, get rid of the you know, as my favorite guy Robin Sharma says, you know, get rid of the energy, energy vampires. Yeah, uh, I think that's critical, and then just master master your calendar. Master, I can usually find people's problems in their calendar. Uh, what gets scheduled gets done, and and, and master lead generation. Sure. Um, leads is the name of the game. You can be not such a great leader and have enough leads, and the leads will help get you through. Um, and, and and that's where most people fail. I, I, who start teams is they start teams because it's the trendy cool thing in the in the office to do when in fact if you're going to start a team you should be working 60 70 hours a week barely catching your breath because you have so much at that kind of business that you can't handle it right but just to start a team because i want to own a team and mean you're and gonna it's be the partners, glam yeah it's the glam way not, and you can say you have a team and look bigger than what you actually are i think that's definitely the wrong way um so the purpose of a team is leverage right you know a car dealership doesn't hire 20 salespeople because they just want to look cool. They, it's, it's the needs-based right. leverage. And if you're going to have a team, you have to offer something And it's because you're a team. And you have more than one person working for you. Why? Because it's really about the client, the right. client experience. It's, it's, I need this person to make sure that you know my customer X is well taken care of and well serviced because I'm, you know, I'm overwhelmed here and I can't do it all by myself. Sure. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Make sure to connect with Mark on all social media platforms and tune in each and every week at samspeaks.com and Sam Speaks Radio Podcast on iTunes. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sam.